I still hold to this day, like the, the best thing that you could do for your jumping output is jumping. I think a lot of people in parkour, they complain about their jump not improving, but how many times do they actually jump their maximum within a training session? Maybe just some deliberate max intent jump training is the thing they need before they even think about starting to pick up a barbell. Alan, welcome back to the Evolve Move Play podcast. Hopefully my camera doesn't keep falling over. <laughs> yeah, thanks for having me, man. It's been a while. When was our first one? 2018, yeah, 19? 2019, yeah. I think it was 2019. So yeah, was, hopefully we'll have uh, more luck this time. I remember we filmed in like the hallway of some sketchy hotel in Brighton and uh, yeah, uh, keep faffing around with the lights and stuff. <laughs> you got a professional mic now. You got to upgrade the camera still. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, well, camera equipment. <laughs> <laughs> I could, I could have. Uh, I didn't know we were doing the. Uh, I didn't know we were recording video, but um, oh, yeah, I, I could get some more lights if uh, yeah. if it's a problem. All right. <laughs> um. <laughs> My camera, for some reason, keeps flopping in a weird way. Let's see if that'll do. Um, yeah, so it was fun to go back to that interview. It was interesting to see kind of it, where I was. I was like, damn, I was doing a bunch of cool shit three years ago. <laughs> oh, really? What's changed? Yeah. Oh, just uh, I've had some health problems. I haven't been able to train this hard because I've had something called uh, a complex in inflammatory response syndrome and so like a lot of my uh i don't know a lot of the stuff that i was pushing three years ago i haven't really had access to so hoping to get it back soon oh damn i've never heard of that uh yeah it's it's a weird thing i hadn't heard of it either it has to do with um so you either get it uh secondary to lyme disease or to mold toxins looks like it was mold toxins in my case so what toxins yeah yeah exposure to mold so you can see the the shelves are bare over there getting to be bare we're in the middle of moving out to a new place oh mole like mold. i thought you said moles I like <laughs> it's like fuck i know i know you fuck with nature and stuff but like i didn't know you would get this close and personal with moles yeah um, i know um, i didn't, I didn't no, that's an appropriate relationship with moles that wasn't the actual issue <laughs> that's funny you should mention mold i've literally just finished um uh cleaning like a bunch of mold uh by the window in my bedroom today um yeah i felt a bit asthmatic last night and i was like oh man it's gotta go yeah um get rid of damn. it luckily it's yeah. like oh, apparently like 10 or 20 percent of the population has like the genetics to have a big response to mold so i just got on that. okay so you should be all right sure. um so yeah it was fun to look back and then also you've had quite an experience of the last couple of years yourself like i think I feel like maybe it was right around that time that you were beginning to really be limited by back pain. Uh, when, yeah. when was that happening? So I think originally the on and off started midway through 2019, maybe right. April, May. Um, and it started being a limiting factor then, but it was very much um, episodic up and down. Um and I had no idea what was causing it to um, flare up and then chill out from week to week or day to day. Mm-hmm. Um, and then had a good amount of time in 2020 where it was fine. Uh, then all kind of went to shit in. Um, no, I, th- I think, yeah, the beginning of 2020 was was bad, like the first month and then was cool until june july yeah then july seriously went downhill um and then the worst i had was maybe like it was it was pretty flat and then the worst i had was um march of 2021 which was when i was kind of i don't want to say bed bound um but it was very difficult to do anything like i I couldn't have been bed bound because staying in bed doing absolutely nothing um was the worst thing i couldn't find one single position in bed where it wasn't flaring up essentially what felt like the whole of my sciatic nerve and everything um surrounding it um yeah it was super hard to sleep and around that time and sneezing was 
possibly the worst thing I could do. Yeah. Apart from I had this one time when I was uh like I would routinely go for walks as part of my rehab. Um but I would have to take um breaks every 30 seconds to a minute or something. Uh uh like sit sit down breaks. And there was one time I remember where um I had my headphones on always walking with podcasts and there was a car trying to like a uh, waste disposal municipal kind of car driving um behind me on the path and they beeped and just the beep like obviously I'm super sensitive and like really high alert to any threat like the beep made me jump and that like just sudden movement just sent like horrible pain all through my body and um yeah there there are simple things like um just like a dog running up to me and making me like move ever so slightly like yeah there was no like uh yeah variability i couldn't i couldn't i had to turn my whole body like that like batman to like cross the road so although walking was therapeutic there were definitely like the right dose of walking was therapeutic but then like going outside was kind of chaos and i really had to uh <laughs> to um limit exposure to any kind of chaos or anything that could yeah sounds really uh, intense how long was it uh kind of at that level um i would say i was keeping it injured for the first couple of weeks after that massive flare-up um because i was doing i was doing some nerve flossing that was way above the level that i way above my tolerance level at the time there's the whole thing of like uh an exercise it like an exercise in a be all end all like you can't just slap a sciatic nerve flossing uh or neural mobilization as it's called um you can't just throw that at it willy-nilly and just expect it to do better like it's it's the dose that makes the poison as well as um i was using a range that was putting way too much tension on the sciatic nerve as well um but then when i finally got a call with um joel proskovitz the um mcgill certified clinician and he told me like yeah you're being a flipping idiot minimize the the range you're just keeping yourself uh injured and stressing having putting too much stress on the nerve and then um he helped me through uh gradually um kind of uh like graded exposure to to stressing the area um to a level that is yeah yeah a good hormetic response i suppose yeah uh, so you're you had to calm everything down and then you had to slowly re-strengthen yourself to the yeah. things that were the old bombing. greg layman quote calm shit down build shit back up and i just yeah. wasn't letting it calm down through the whole time of, through my rehab process i was um a lot of the rehab i was doing before that point was it was not graded exposure it was doing the mcgill big three and then like for a month or two straight and then be like uh this was after every single flare-up doing doing that for two months sp straight just steady low intensity core stability exercises and then um um i'd be like oh it's been two months i'll i yeah. can get back to training now then we'll go out with the others to film and then have like a massive setback again and it's like i don't know how many times i had to actually learn a lesson from doing that same mistake um but yeah that last uh um that call that i had with um Joel Proskovitz, uh, it finally just hit home that it needs to be graded exposure and very gradual and you need to, and th there was just a point in my, uh, rehab where most of my rehab was just doing parkour to like get me back to yeah. a normal session of parkour, but it wasn't like a parkour session. It was like RPE one and then next week it'll be two and then like if we're going to use the perceived mm -hmm. exertion scale um but was like a time when you just had to put out of way parkour completely for a while yeah oh yeah yeah absolutely there was there was no chance of of doing How parkour for quite a lot of it um it's hard to put a number on it because as i said uh there were times when i was able to do 
very small things and then like it was it was a lot of trial and error with like not all those times of me doing like these two months of um mcgill big three was me um strictly not doing any parkour as well there was um mcgill big three can you remind me what that is so there's um the bird dog which is the um the bird dog um maybe i can pull it up just getting on hands and knees right they're just they're just isometric core exercises um yeah hands hands and knees and one hand out in front one hand out in front uh, then do you lift the oh the opposite contralateral leg yeah 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 and then the opposite leg up and then there's a side plank side plank um and then there's the McGill curl up, which is the weirdest looking one. I'm trying to go through one of his books right now, and there's, um, I'm not going to be able to find it. I, I, no worries. Like the the curl up is like, um, um, like a very tame looking crunch or sit up okay. where you only it's it's all just core stuff that's isometric and you don't actually move any segments in your spine apart from the last one where it's like some of your neck, but um. Yeah, I needed stuff that was actually um, moving the spine, like with graded exposure. Mm-hmm. Um, so uh, just avoiding that entirely um, wasn't that useful either. But it did do something to, um, you know, just get some blood flow and um, to desensitize the area for a time. But it definitely needed um, something that was a bit more specific to, you know, the yeah variety of parkour yeah you can't go from the those three exercises to doing climb ups and front flips um yeah and, yeah yeah like all of those involve a lot of spinal flexion or uh yeah depth drops right like any type of drop is gonna involve flexion no matter how good your form is right you're gonna flex mm. yeah, yeah 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 it's unavoidable so- so you um so you, you had that consultation it seems like you've been pretty much pain free in your back for a number of months now or at least you're you're what i see on your instagram it looks like you're moving much more like yourself again and have been for quite a while yeah yeah i'm 31 now and i can definitely say i'm feeling better at 31 than i was uh <laughs> um previous years like from 28 to be fair like yeah, yeah. um yeah and i'm able to um like i can say that um not managing load appropriately between um my strength training um and my parkour training was a factor in injuring me but now i'm back to the gym and just going into it a lot wiser um than just kind of going at it willy-nilly like i was in my mid-20s where i could get away with it um so I've I've learned a lot and I'm not like that post hoc fallacy guy that's like, yeah, deadlifting and, and squatting fucked my back. So like, I'm never doing it again. I'm not like spreading that dogma around the parkour community. I think now I can come at it with wisdom and be with more wisdom and be that voice of reason that says, if you're going to do this stuff, like it's lifting for parkour isn't a magic bullet. And if you don't use it properly, you can especially if you're trying to uh, use lifting weights for parkour as a tool for longevity, it's realizing that if you cock it up in terms of load management, then um, you could end up shortening your career um, with something that you intended to prolong it with. And, um, and we're famous for overtraining as it is like, it's, it's absolutely outrageous. Um, The amount of uh, people within our community that, have uh chronic patellofemoral pain syndrome or various tendinopathies and think that um adding more knees over toes guy exercises is their um magic bullet to get them out of pain it's like yes plow yourself into the ground with more overtraining when you're already overtrained um and this might be why it's running rampant through our community that stretching and foam rolling um are the things to get you out of pain because maybe that means just you're you're stopping picking the scab for a little bit like (laughs) (laughs) yeah so what does a normal training a week look like for you now right how do you balance your parkour practices your 
uh, strength training, any other ancillary training that you do? Um, what does that look like over the course of a, a training week? So right now, in terms of strength training stuff, I've ditched the idea of programming altogether in the sense that I don't try and give myself um, 12 weeks of phasic structure, phase potentiation, um, mm. s- like structured training plan anymore, because I think that was partly why um, I fucked up in the first place already, because I was trying to strictly stay to these training sessions and give my, like a training, a, um, a strength training program is meant to give you the perfect amount of stress to you're walking that fine Goldilocks zone, um, trying to not undertrain yourself and not overtrain yourself and just hit that nice bit in the middle, um, to give you a positive, uh, stimulus. And I was, um, I was doing that and I was training parkour six days a week on top of that. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> yeah. So when um, I, so when I first started all this stuff, right. I was, telling, I was telling my wife about this. So oh God, I was talking about my wife this morning about this. And when I was 26 years old, I was doing four parkour sessions a week, two mm-hmm. Muay Thai sessions a week, one jujitsu session a week, two strength training sessions a week, and one long run a week. Um, right. And I was very fit. <laughs> like It was yeah. working pretty well. Um, but I was only working like a dozen hours a week. Right. So then I moved down to Seattle and I started, eventually I was working. I would teach the 7 a.m. CrossFit class, 8 a.m. CrossFit class, 10 a.m. CrossFit class, 12 p.m. CrossFit class, 4 right. p.m. kids CrossFit, 5 p.m., 6 p.m., 7 p.m. And then I got to teach parkour at 8. And I would do that five days a week and then teach three classes on Saturday. Oh, um, yeah. And so, and then I was just, still training parkour like five or six days a week. And then I would do like CrossFit wads two days a week. And I was doing, um, not starting strength, but I was doing the Texas program from, uh, Mark Ripito. Oh yeah. That's quite high volume, high frequency, yeah. right? Yeah. 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 So at the end of all that, like I was deadlifting 440 squatting 355 for five reps. Um, I did Fran in like 223 or something, really, really fast crossfit workouts, but I actually gained a massive amount of body fat from the overstress. And then right. through a period of time where I just had injury after injury after injury. I, I Yeah. Nah. Like the year after, kind of as we founded Parkour Visions and started the gym on our own within like from 2009 to 2011. I tore ligaments of both my feet, had two back spasms, a neck spasm, retore a rotator cuff injury from an old rotator cuff injury, um, subluxated one of my my cuboid bone, I tore my Achilles tendon, and then had a high ankle sprain on the other ankle. Oh, holy shit. That was all in the same kind of age range that you were when you were going through your back pain experience because I was 27 to 30. 20 yeah, 30 yeah. Time. Um so I learned a little bit about overtraining and then I, I was, you know, one of the first guys who was teaching parkour athletes to strength train and we started with starting strength. And then we just mm-hmm. realized that like, you can't train parkour and do three days of three by five squat deadlift mm-hmm. and, and bench press. It's just not feasible for most parkour athletes. It's just the volume's way too, way too high. Um, so I think a lot mm-hmm. of times we go into these other programs and just don't realize that they're not really designed for for an athlete who has a primary sport that's as physically intensive as parkour is. Yeah, at least without like a an actually like an allocated off season. Yeah, yeah, um, <laughs> yeah. And we're pretty bad at that. I mean, it's it's easier when you're living in Seattle where you have snow and stuff. But yeah, with okay. the park with the uh, parkour visions gym that you used to have, like um, yeah, we're trying all the time. Uh, the winters yeah. here are the same as in London. It's it's no, there's no snow. Or I like we got yeah. snow last year. Mm. It's very similar. Um, so so okay. So you're 
it's funny. I, so last year I hired a personal trainer and I was like, okay, I'm going to work with you on my program. And, mm. and like, he was, he kind of didn't understand it because he, you know, he'd like help me write the program, but then every workout I was changing it. But, uh, but for me, it was like, I have to auto-regulate because it's so much in relationship to what's happening in my primary practice. And then yes. this year I, uh, I have, I've set up my goals. I've got my, my standards that I'm working towards. Um, but I've just decided that like, I have my, it's like, it's, it's better if it's a very loose structure and then it's just about tracking, right? For me now, tracking yeah. is way more important than, than programming. I want to yeah. know clearly that I'm improving week to week and know when I'm exhibiting signs of overtraining. So I'm tracking my HRV and then I'm looking at, and I have subjective tracking and then I'm looking at what happens like like if i code every training session like whether i did something that was a pr for this training cycle or it's the same or i regressed and if all and so everything that's regression is red so if all of a sudden i see multiple sessions where i'm red right across multiple things it's like time to take a week off right interesting yeah yeah yeah. or at least like um radically uh deload Radic- yeah radical deload um, yeah whether it's volume frequency or or intensity but yeah that's that's uh i might i might try and implement that somehow yeah um spreadsheets. yeah i think <laughs> it's all music yeah I, I don't know i'm not such a spreadsheet guy but i've had to when um programming trying to program for like other athletes and stuff but um I'm, a spreadsheet guy, but I'm becoming one i'm trying to i think auto regulation is is um as how it's got to be i think there are too many uh coaches that are giving giving out 12 week plans and expecting to for the athlete to hit their numbers that they prescribed 12 weeks time from then uh, as if they've got like some magic crystal ball or something mm-hmm. um and and every fourth week is a deload week and uh, I think it's, it's Angus Bradley uh, who recently says um, life will deload you. Like there, there are, there are various things like your girlfriend breaks up with you, your cat dies, you go on holiday, like um, you have exams coming up or something. Um, there, there, there will be plenty of reasons to deload, but, uh, and he's very, um, he is not trying to throw away the idea of period that, periodization entirely but he's very much trying to push the idea of the golden micro cycle which has really resonated with me because um that's kind of what i've been doing recently Uh, but the only difference is um um i will be fitting my strength training around my parkour stuff um like and i might not go to the gym for two weeks straight because I'm focusing on the thing that is way more meaningful for me in terms of what brings me more fulfillment and happiness. Um, and that's not always down to, um, like power output and stuff. Uh, yeah. Um, but yeah, I think, I think, um, yeah, I forgot where I was going with that. Yeah. <laughs> I like the golden, the golden micro cycle. That's what the way I've been thinking about a lot of it is like, can I, can I get a good training weekend? Can I like, that's it. Yeah. Get my goals across this week. And then can I do it again the next week? Right. And if, yeah. And, and if I'm like extra fatigued at the end of a training, uh, training week, I'll take a couple more days rest and restart my cycle. Mm. Uh, the next thing it's just like put, put together cycle after cycle of, of positive, uh, of a good week. Yeah. That's, that's it. Um, I Still think like, heading towards the same general goal. I think. Yeah. Um, have you re- have you read Franz Bosch? Uh, I have his book here. Strength and coordination and integrated approach. Yeah, I have that here, but uh, I haven't picked it up yet um, because I've just got other stuff I've been working on and reading through. And plus, I keep hearing um, people slating uh, Franz Bosch's work, although saying that they found some. Um, useful gems in there um so i haven't gone digging for the gems yet um yeah but, i mean uh, some yeah. of the exercise prescription i think like i wanted to ask you about this hey so now we need to take a moment for a word from our sponsor 
which is ourselves, Evolve Move Play. You may not know this, but Evolve Move Play has an amazing online course system designed to help you take on the ideas that we share in this podcast as an actual physical practice. So we built in-depth instructional guides to help you build a complete natural movement practice, including how to safely build your skills up, how to identify areas where you can train, whether in a beautiful natural space like this, a gym, a playground, or an urban area near you, whatever you need to make it work for you. We designed a way to incorporate it into an overall natural movement lifestyle to help rejuvenate your body and mind and how to integrate mindfulness so that you can gain the most from your movement practice and translate it into your life. When you join any of our programs, you'll also get access to our exclusive members area. This is an online forum separated from all the big social media sites where you're gonna have dedicated conversations around movement mindfulness, nature connection, community, the core themes that we explore on the Evolve Move Play podcast. There's a growing community from all over the world who are now putting the Evolve Move Play practices into their lives. We want you to join us in experiencing how powerful that can be and how powerful a space devoted to these practices can be. So if you've been loving the ideas that we share on the Evolve Move Play podcast, I think you owe it to yourself to take the next step and experience what Evolve Move Play can offer as a teaching platform. There's so many great resources for you, and we've got a variety of programs available that you can get started with that meet your level, or if you really want to save some money, you can grab one of our bundles that covers a variety of our programs. If you love the ideas that are shared on the Evolve Move Play Movement podcast, and you wanna take them from just being ideas to actually being practices that you're using in your life, then you can start today by joining us for one of our online courses, or you can save big by grabbing a bundle of many of our courses together. You can find those at the uh, link in the description or by clicking here. There's this, this issue of like, how specific should our ancillary training be? Right? Yeah. Do we want to yeah, yeah. like do a few generalized strength stuff and then just focus on the sport? Or do we want to try to like meet in the middle with highly sport specific things? I think a lot of what Franz does is very sport specific. He's trying to get the, the mm. training room environment to mimic the sport environment as much as possible, which might actually be really important for something like a track and field athlete. Yeah. Might not work real well for something like a parkour athlete or a basketball athlete. There's there's too much variability, too much variability. Um, And so just a general stimulus that, that hits some missing features becomes important. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think a lot of it is uh, like foundation based and then, um, like like max strength output and then um just lots of tissue work with extensive plyometrics and like the assistance lifts like whether it's machine stuff or um calf raises i would put in anyone's program and um like extensive plyometrics sorry you wouldn't put any other than anyone in anyone's program oh i would i would would. everyone gets calf raises yeah, I, I would say everyone gets calf raises, whether they're weighted or um yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. but also like the more extensive plyometric stuff. Um I don't know, everyone's got ankles. So <laughs> yeah. Well, I think it's so interesting because you know that there are athletes who perform at the highest level of parkour who do no ancillary training. Right? It's yeah. The same in jiu-jitsu and same in all these sports. And so we always know that like you can get a lot just from the sport. The sport is mm. conditioning from the sport. But the flip side is that most of the most successful athletes eventually adopt some sort of ancillary training. There's a few mm. freaks who make it. Another thing that I've noticed, like my, my perspective on it is like, if you start young and you've got great circumstances and great genetics, then you can just ride mm. your sport for a really long time. Uh, but when you've got injury histories, when you're older, when you're doing all these things, you need more targeted ways of pushing a physiological overhead so you're not you're not reaching your limits in your primary sport which is chaotic yeah and that's, and that's it's, the purpose of these things yeah, yeah 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 and and it's it's to remember that it is uh a supplement as well um yeah. and there are so many people that use the example of yeah but mr x mm-hmm. Um, is one of the best in our sport and doesn't doesn't do do anything or or any uh, conditioning or 
supplementary training for their sport and look at them it's like yeah but they are like it, it's not to say that they can't be way better with it um <laughs> like yeah Siebe, Siebe van der Speiger, um from the Netherlands he doesn't lift or do much in the gym but he carries himself like a track athlete on walls like he's yeah. um he's absolutely insane and i'm working i started working with him right now um and i'm super excited to see what cannons he's gonna have um <laughs> like after because it, it's it's um it's uh low-hanging fruit if you've not tried to increase your max force production before then i think that is you can get some serious novice gains yeah well it's interesting because i mean i'm i guess i'm of two minds about that like i think there's a really a place for it but at the same time i think sometimes those athletes who are already really powerful it's like they've managed to get the adaptations from the thing right it's like it may not have been the most efficient pathway but like i've had seen so many parkour athletes who uh can like come in and do a a double bodyweight deadlift on their first attempt or Mm. you know because all the jumping built their legs. But yeah, yeah. what I've found is that taking someone from a single body weight deadlift to a double body weight deadlift will do a huge amount for their broad jump. But taking them above a body a double body weight deadlift doesn't necessarily add that much to their strength, to their yeah, expression it, in the sport. It might come to a, a point of diminishing returns, I suppose. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Then, so then, but the thing about it is that so if I you take that young athlete who, who's kind of like you can't you can't give him the adaptations that he's looking for with anything else other than the sport, right? Or if you do, it's like mm. I, I wouldn't use a deadlift to be it'd be plyometrics, right? Like if you're gonna make somebody who's already got really, really strong legs better, you need things that can can load in a more similar way. Um But like I'm, (laughs) I'm 40 now and Mm. I used to jump nine feet, seven inches. And now I jump like after this recent health thing that I went through, I'm down to eight feet, seven inches. It's like, right. It's way more efficient for me to go into the gym and do front squats and, and, and deadlifts while I'm rebuilding because Mm. I can do that with less cost on my body actually than trying to regain that solely through my parkour training sure i think i understand yeah so that, that's my perspective on it um so i want to go back to so you're so you're not you don't have a program for yourself but no you do and, you, and uh, i like what you said about like it might might i might take two weeks off from the gym if it if that's where I, what i need to do with my parkour one of the things that i've been really thinking about is like you have to prioritize your training like mm. Like the big thing that everyone is like, you got to do this exercise. You got to do this exercise. And then what, what's the result? You do too much. Yeah. You get injured. Yeah. 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 Right. It's like, you got to choose the number one thing and everything is about how you're getting that better. Right. And if it's not mm-hmm. contributing, then you got to get rid of it. Um, and then you, you know, and you can have a, you should have a few priorities in your training, but you got to be willing to sacrifice. If you're like, right now, my main thing is just, dialing my level three climb up in and it's like if uh if if it takes me a long time that day to do that to get the volume in that i want on that then the corkscrew just goes out the window because it's not as high a priority for me but it's a higher priority yeah. than something yeah. and this, this is another reason why um giving a parkour athlete a, a, a 12 week um lifting cycle is kind of benign because uh because our goals change like a drop of a hat sometimes as well. <laughs> and um, uh, not only what you're lifting for, but the motivation to do that thing when now you're super stoked about pushing your your mental game or your acrobatic stuff. Yeah. Um, and yeah. So you're, so what, okay. So you don't have a program, but like take me through a typical week. Like what, how many sessions are you putting in? What's the kind of volume per session? Um, you know, what kind of intensity are you working at? Um, well, right now, so my last, oh, someone at the door, the last couple of months, um, well, I mean, 
the last few months around training, I suppose, I've been focusing on um, just increasing max strength uh, with the deadlift and then also um, another day of the week. If I can fit in two training days in a week, I will also do front squat and Romanian deadlift. Mm -hmm. And um, I'll normally have uh, similar accessories um, alongside that. Uh, well, well, more like assistance exercises. Uh, and there'll normally be some plyos, whether they're intensive plyos or extensive plyos uh, for people listening. That's like more max jump or just like extensive are more skipping kind of based, uh, shorter ground contact um, stuff. Um, and I'll normally, in terms of split, I'll normally do whole body, but then... The only alternation will be uh, push and pull, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, How long is it to the session? I think, <laughs> I think about two hours. About two hours, okay. Yeah, including including warm up. So <laughs> that's longer than what most people would recommend. Yeah, yeah. If you're doing a deadlift session, are you doing like how many sets and like how many reps per set? I would say. Um, reps anywhere between one to six usually um, unless it's kind of a um, like a lower intensity day um, and I'm not feel like I'm firing all on all cylinders that day I'll I'll sometimes do like go up to eight or ten um, uh, or if I'm just feeling a bit punitive um, <laughs> um, um, and in terms of volume I'll normally I normally do three, three sets, three working sets, um, just with normal deadlift. But often I will kind of do my workup sets with deficit deadlift, which has been a bit of a revelation for me with my uh, deadlift. Uh, like in terms of like getting that initial leg drive, that initial pull off the ground. Um, yeah, the deficit deadlifts is has been a uh, great help and there's normally like three working sets with that then three working set sets with the um conventional deadlift uh and that would normally be cool and then um i won't usually be completely spent after that um i'm not normally have some uh pap effect to actually do some uh some kind of intensive plyos after that still um so you then usually with. i'll so you kind of warm up, you start with your deadlifts, you do sets across yeah. or you do uh, supersets. With it, yeah, it depends. It, I think usually with the, um, with the working sets, with the deficit deadlift, I'll normally do um, sets across. Okay. Uh, so like three sets across. And then um, I'll work up to a top set with um, the normal conventional deadlift. Yeah. Uh, that's more what I've been doing recently. Two, but with front... Best. Um, I would say, yeah, three to four minute, three, three, three to four minutes. minute rest. Um, but with like front squats and RDLs, I'll usually do, um, three to four sets across, okay. uh, and a little, usually, I think a little shorter, um, rest between sets, but I'm not super strict. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah. A lot of this, I just, just feel it out. Yeah. Yeah. And then, so has the deadlift been a kind of primary driver like for your strength training for a long time or is that more specifically to this this kind of current cycle i think yeah this current cycle like since um getting back in the gym this year i've been just focusing on uh conventional deadlift uh i've used sumo a lot before um and i just feel and the more i hear that suits i think sumo deadlift is more of a I feel like it's more of a powerlifting exercise to cut range. Yeah, um, yeah. I agree. And good for your groin, though. Yeah, exactly. It's way more, way more adductor intensive rather than. Um, I mean, it still works your glutes, but like, um, I've certainly felt a lot more. Um, I mean, judging from the DOMS I'll get, like my hamstrings and glutes will feel fried uh, after 
yeah. a heavy day um and that's like oh cool i'm working the right muscles this time where um yeah and you um so are you training so you're doing plyometrics so you're doing sort of like broad jumps repeat broad jumps uh depth drops yeah. skips like kind of what's the balance of those it's yeah, I would say classic. like the the classic the classic um Uri Verkachansky stuff as well as um some inspiration from Matt McKinnis Watson, the the uh he he's known as the Plyo guy. He his okay. company is called Plyo uh plus Plyos. Okay. Um and he he's got a P he wrote a PhD on uh plyometric training. Uh, pretty much and is is releasing a lot of really cool content um on instagram and um but yeah i guess a lot of the intensive plyometric stuff i'll be doing will be trying to mimic uh the stuff that's in the sport as well whether they're yeah. uh strides bounds um and uh is it ryan ford that coined the quad jump yeah, the quad jump. Oh, the quad jump. Yeah. So, like the standing broad yeah. to uh, stride, stride, plyo, and I'll normally at the end of that, instead of just landing, I will turn that last plyo into a um, plyo vert jump. So it'll be a mm. quintuple jump because <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'll just I'll just add another yeah, uh, that's cool. vert jump at the end. Nice. Um, so yeah, just just stuff like that, and yeah. yeah. Just no focusing reason. on maximum output because I think a lot of people in parkour they complain about um, not their, their jump not improving, but how many times do they actually jump their maximum with within a training session? Like they actually accumulate such a low volume of max output jumps, um, and maybe just some deliberate max intent jump training is the thing they need before they even think about starting to pick up a barbell. Um, because I, I still hold to this day, like the, the best thing that you could do for your jumping output is jumping um, yeah. for a lot of people. But then of course, the if you get the plateau from that, then you can turn to the low hanging fruit of trying to increase your base level strength. I'd be curious. I'd be curious to run an experiment with some athletes and see, like, if you take a group of training athletes who are already training parkour, so they're doing a fair amount of jumping, they're getting elasticity. Like, I don't know if you've been following uh, scientific bouncing. Uh, uh, a little bit. Uh, Kevin Soter, right? Yeah, Kevin Soter. Um, yeah. I can't remember if I, I'm pretty sure I'm following him, but is he still producing content? Or has he kind of gone silent? But he highlighted some really good, some interesting research where they were looking at, like, the the kind of um, physiological characteristics of not even elite parkour athletes, but like intermediate parkour athletes. And they're saying that they're extremely kind of outliers for stiffness and, you know, like basically the most explosive athletes, more than sprinters, more than mm. jumpers. Um, so you're... It is insane. Yeah. So you're... The, the, that volume that, in, that you're getting from parkour, it's going to be conditioning the tissues to have elasticity. So doing more jumping um I, i'm i i think it really depends on the athlete whether they're going to need more jumping or just to build the strength base at yeah point. i i think so yeah 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 and it's very hard to um to to test these things beforehand yeah. other than just like being with them and or just watching what they post on Instagram and stuff. It's like, it's so hard to paint a picture of what their training week actually looks like. And um, we can't do any of these, like, um, I don't know if you're following William Wayland on powering through. Um, uh, I, I, I used to talk to William all the way back in the day. Oh my God. Yeah. Man. Yeah. I'm sure. What the forum was. Remember there was a forum that wasn't urban free flow and wasn't worldwide jam. Worldwide Jam, holy crap! Yeah, remember? Yeah, that? yeah. Wow. He used to write like, for them. He used to write for them a bit. Yeah, he used to write for them. So I used to just go back and forth with him on that forum, and then I think we were on MSN Messenger together and like a few times. Um, but I haven't followed his stuff deeply in a long time. But yeah, I remember. Yeah, well. he's gone far. He's gone far. He's uh, he's on the PGA um, tour now. I think coaching oh, nice. uh, pro golfers. So there's there's a lot of money in that <laughs> <laughs> i'm sure it's better than parkour uh, yeah uh, so cool yeah so 
yeah, like from like just in my own training right now, it's interesting because I'm I have a sense that that I've lost some strength for various reasons. And it's like I just need to rebuild my strength base. And then the maximal plyometric work I want to kind of bring in a little bit later in the cycle. So it's like right now, shield the parkour, do the do the parkour specific stuff that's already giving me strength to die, uh, you know, the the kind of elastic adaptions, do the strength mm-hmm. work. And then there's once I get to a certain level of strength, there's diminishing returns on the strength. And yeah. now I can de-emphasize that and then I can go over and just do bounds. And it's like, okay. When I do strides right now, I'm getting a lot of adaptation and my body's remembering everything. It's rebuilding those connections. There's mm-hmm. going to be a point at which the technical demand of a bigger stride is going to be too high for it to be a really optimized tool to drive the pure power production. And that's when I think it becomes really important to just be like, go do bounds, go do maximal jumps. Right. Yeah, so I think it's interesting. Yeah, mm. I don't know. I, I my my theory is that jump specific training is something that with a lot of athletes I would add kind of late in the developmental phase. But on the flip side, like I look at my son, my son's eight years old, and for him, I'm I like we're not gonna do any formal like weighted training for years and years and years now, right? But Mm -hmm. having him just do maximal vertical jumps and maximal broad jumps all the time is great for him, right? He's so yeah, so elastic. So again, I think it really depends on where the type of athlete you're working on, training age of the athlete, and the kind of specifics of their nervous system. How we how we address that? That's that's kind of what I was going to say. That's why I brought up uh, Will Wayland because he's shown some posts of him screening athletes to test their um whether they're more like he gets them doing like a rack pull from um like into a pretty much into the rack with a barbell and they have a force plate underneath them so they're and this is at like mid yeah mid thigh pull isometric and uh so they'll test max force production from that and then they'll get them to do say like a counter movement jump and uh maybe they'll test something like uh like an expression of power somehow i can't remember how they do that so like more in the middle of the force velocity curve um and then he does a lot of data science and maths and stuff. And then, and then it says like, you need more of this in your training or you need more of this. And, uh, I don't know, it'll, it'll be cool to look at his, his data. I, he only like kind of scratches the surface on, um, his method with that, but, but like a kind of interesting way. Um, was that along the lines of what you were talking about? Yeah. Yeah. I think uh, like I, I was really influenced by Spark performance science. Have you run into those guys? I've heard only you talking about okay. it before, maybe. Yeah, but they basically did. They would have every uh, every hour athlete do six jumps on a force plate in order to create a force profile of how they're producing force on the ground. So, basically, what's their eccentric rate of force production? Uh, yeah, how much do they lose force production during their amortization phase? Yeah, yeah. How yeah. long are they able to extend their period of force? Uh, yeah, force development, and then based on that, they can kind of identify it so for for me for instance they didn't want me to do any deadlifting they wanted me to only use split squats and um stuff like that as my primary strength driving tool because i had very good stability of force production uh and relatively poor time of force production right which was uh which worked really well Um, for me at the time i improved a lot by switching from a deadlift focused program because it was very influenced by um underground secrets for running faster by allison felix's coach at the time so i was just focused on deadlift and then i went and switched to the split squat and the volume of training that i put in the gym for the results was like dramatically changed Hmm. yeah i wonder if it was just like a different stimulus that uh yeah i don't know do you do you remember wait could, could you go over again why um what was the rationale for that yeah, so would so you have your eccentric rate of force production. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
they find is correlated with the strength of the quad, calf, and anterior core. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah, yeah. basically how quick you're able to get down, right? Or how mm. much, how much, how much stiffness and force you can get out. How quickly that builds up in the counter movement of a counter movement jump, right? Yeah, yeah. Then yeah, yeah. when you are mortisizing, when you're moving between the 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 yeah 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 phase, people will leak force. So you'll see, you know, the knees buckling a lot, the back rounding a lot. And this is associated with um, with having a kind of more of a decrease in force production during amortization. And they mm. found that the deadlift is the tool that best increases the stability of the body to kind of absorb force in that amortization phase. So the 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 theory behind that is that that's kind of the the best development of the back line and the like myofascial meridian ideas right so your spinal right. erectors and hamstrings are basically mm. what drives that um that component and keeps you able to kind of sustain that and then the last mm. piece is that ability to prolong force production which has to do with mobility and control like being able to do a more controlled eccentric or a longer eccentric and then it also has to do specifically with the glutes and being able to get into deep hip hyperextension okay so yeah yeah yeah. so for me what they saw was uh i like i could deadlift very well i was very strong um but i didn't prolong force very well and what they find is that for athletes with that profile what they found is that if there's a 15 percentage so they do everything on percentiles so i scored in the athletic pool in the 66 percentile for that's uh, deadlift kind of, uh, I, th- I think they call that the explodability. Um, explodability. Yeah. Nice. I, I scored in the 66th percentile for that, but I was in the 47th percentile for the the time variable. Yeah, yeah. variable. They find when there's more than a 15% difference between your top and b- a bottom capacity, you'll see a specific pattern of injury arise. So someone who's low in time of force production, high in stability of force production, you'll see a lot of uh, hamstring strains, Achilles problems, and ankle sprains, which is exactly what Mm. I had historically been dealing with. Interestingly, athletes who are low in that um, that stability component tend to have back pain issues. You see that, but I I wouldn't expect most parkour athletes to end up in that profile. Because it's really associated with rotational athletes like golfers and baseball players. It's people who right. are really good at disassociating the shoulders from the hips mm. and creating that whipping dynamic, which we don't do very much in parkour, right? Yeah, I've heard some athletes getting um, attributing uh, some back pain to uh, twisting. Yeah, I think Verky Ver- Ver- has even said, and um, uh, recently in a podcast with Egg from sorry you, you um, broke bees. up for a second there verky said what about his back i think um verky in the past has had some some issues with twisting as well as ethan rudd from the motors projects uh yeah uh, recently said in his uh a podcast he did with the beans guys yeah um, I've, I've heard that as well i've had athletes who i know people who basically went for trying to get their double cork over and over and over again and then just messed up their back and retired yeah (laughs) oh fuck yeah yeah um so um so i want to go back to your training you were talking about the deadlift so i imagine the deadlifting itself is not your primary goal your primary goal is jumping farther is that correct yeah 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 essentially and and as well as um just building a more robust back as well like so like um and i i think a deadlift the deadlift is quite uh a broad brush that you can apply to to training uh, specifically uh my training anyway um with like trying to gain that anti-fragility and um um while also uh trying to increase uh jumping output and everything but on top of on top of deadlift for the spine anti-fragility i've been trying to 
strength train my spine in uh, many different ways and and all the different planes. So I've been doing like twisting. I've been doing um, some stuff in more frontal plane and I've yeah. been doing lots of flexing. I've been doing some Zercher deadlifts as well, mm-hmm. um, which is, yeah, some some stuff that makes people's um think like these uh uh smooth brained weak spined people um who have have been have had all the dogmas from squat university and everything and Stuart McGill uh that your spine is fragile and should never should never bend um but yeah if you're if you only use perfect form, you're going to be fragile to when your form ultimately breaks down or you, yeah, I don't know, go out of that comfort yes. zone. So I've, I've been trying to add uh, a bit of chaos, but, but the, um, the trick is in loading it properly. Like I haven't started doing these Zercher deadlifts with 130 kilos. I'm like yeah. I've, it used to, um, kind of make my lower back uh flare up a little bit just trying to get under the bar into that position and i was like nope but um i have gradually got it up to 130 kilos and it has uh just been like something to prove to myself um as well as just trying to make my back as strong as possible so i can so that is no longer a factor in, in yeah. my training anymore yeah, um sense. and it's just like having that principle across training in its to- uh, totality as well and and like um that's that's uh one of the mindset i'm going for right now to supplement training uh i would say mindset of of great exposure to all the things that might be dangerous to your back <laughs> not not just back but like uh, across the board in yeah. training i suppose uh, and and of course like you can't cover all your bases but um um yeah like uh, like i'm it's going to be hard to protect yourself against like inversion sprains in the ankle and everything yeah. but like you can't you can't do everything but the back is the back and knees have been like a good focus of mine yeah. not shying away from going into those deep ranges I sprained my ankle, my right ankle last November, and I'm still missing uh, range of motion. I still have a little interior impingement on my right ankle, even a year mm. later. And then I sprained my left ankle um, this October. <laughs> um, I had been like, I sprained my ankles a bunch in my teens, and then I sprained one ankle uh, when I, the year I turned 30, I think. Mm. But that was, you know, it'd been since then, since I sprained an ankle and I sprained each ankle, you know, for the last two years. So I've been obsessed with the idea of like, not only how do I strengthen the tissues, but how do I get the best sort of perception action coupling of the type of actions that will lead to an ankle sprain so that I can be better attuned to my alternative strategies. It's like, how do, how do we get that graded exposure as close to the ankle sprain mechanism? Right without actually spraining the ankle. Cause it's like I'm, <laughs> right now I'm still in the stage of doing, you know, just like going into a lunge, inverting the ankle and just doing reps of moving the ankle into and out of inversion. Like the, that's where the tissues are. Uh, they don't need anything more, more intense, but I'm like, like I can't make, you're never going to make those tissues strong enough to like land on a curb from a. Yeah. Bump, yeah. 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 Right. Yeah. <laughs> There's like, no such thing as bulletproof. <laughs> like, no bulletproof, but but there is there's also like people don't realize how much it's like the reason you sprain your ankle isn't just because the tissues are weak. It's because you didn't have the right kind of awareness to yeah. recognize what was happening in the situation and to reorganize your body in that mm. situation. Um like this last time I sprained my ankle doing a Kong vault, all right, balking on a Kong vault. Mm. My uh I was on kind of shitty wood chips and uh I decided not to do this Kong vault at the last minute when I put my my uh, my lead foot down, it just turned over. Mm. And I was like, that's such a dumb way to sprain your ankle. I've never, I've done. I've it's done always dumb. Million. It's always dumb. <laughs> <laughs> but I knew I was really fatigued. I'd been dealing with all this fatigue stuff. So I was like, kind of towards the end of the session. And I was like, ah, I didn't sprain my ankle because something was wrong with my ankle. I sprained something because something was wrong with my nervous system. How mm. do I get all of that better connected? 
that's been yeah. the obsession right now. I mean, I've put out some good stuff around ankle sprints, but I, what's one? I'm just thinking about a lot right now. Um, yeah. Okay. So I'm curious about how much you've seen, like the, how much has the deadlift driven your bra jump? Like when I started deadlifting, I went from like a nine foot bra jump to a nine and a half foot bra jump over say six months. Have you been able to track that kind of progress? Um, so the main way I'm tracking it is like, I'm, I'm not measuring in the gym really mm. like, and, and that's something I do really need to get into, but I'm such, it's so annoying that I'm kind of a feeler with these things. So I'll, I will from session to session. And I know this is super unscientific as well, because there's so much variability between uh session and what affect your um, jumping output on that day. Um, in within that training session but like i i will just notice that it was really easy to make this near near maximum standing jump than it was uh last month or something for example so that's kind of one way it will just be noticing rather than being super scientific and taking a tape measure to a gym uh but another way recently i've been doing it and uh the people at my uh commercial gym find this very amusing uh especially mm -hmm. um the people that work there although i haven't been kicked out yet is i've been trying to do um vert jumps and putting my head through the ceiling panels they're like <laughs> office office ceiling panels um and i know like the vert jump isn't isn't necessarily translate to broad jump distance or whatever but that's Absolutely. that's just something that i've been like hmm, a little better this time like i got my head like an inch through the panels where like a couple of months ago like i wasn't able to get uh yeah. I wasn't able to touch it and now it's like oh i'm touching my hair and that's like oh yeah i got a good my head went in a good few inches then <laughs> um yeah as but, long as you yeah. have like a clear a clear test i think you know it's useful over time so like i'm not i'm not like i have access to a force put or to a, to like a jump mat i can measure my bra uh, my vertical on that but i just i practice dunking once a week mm. oh nice it's like you know it's a uh, there was some good research that came out that showed that if you practice vertical jumping to a target, uh, exactly, yeah, 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 better. So I was like, well, hence the ceiling. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, like normally they mean like trying to touch something with your hand, yeah. but I'm literally in the gym. Yeah, it's, <laughs> same effect. Uh, I, it's probably the same. So for me, it's like, oh, it's motivating. It's fun to dunk. It adds a little bit more variability. You know, yeah, so yeah, going yeah, up yeah, one leg, two legs. Uh, both feet, you know, I play with different ball sizes for differential learning and everything. And, it's yeah, like, yeah, and then sure. I just, I'm just noting it and I have an adjustable rim. So I'm, I'm adjusting the rim down okay, okay. for low rim dunking. And then every week I'm trying to raise that rim a little bit. And that's like, okay, mm -hmm. I don't need to know exactly what my technical vertical is on a vert tech or a thing. It's like, I can dunk on nine feet seven or I can dunk on nine feet nine or 10 or, you know, eventually I, you know, the goal is, um, to be able to dunk easily from a right foot plant, a left foot plant, a left, right, and a right, left. If I get all four mm -hmm. of those, I can probably have pretty good vertical jump. It's good enough. Right. I'm yeah. Not, yeah, yeah, yeah. Much more. Um, but I like that kind of just, you can turn the training into the test as long as you have a way to track the change over time. Mm. So yeah, right yeah. now I'm going to start tracking I'm not going to be tracking my standing broad jump, even though that's like the the standard test. I'm just going to track my precision jumps, <laughs> but I have the ability right. to adjust the precision jump and make it bigger every time. And then, then I can track yeah. it. So oh, here, this is what I did this week. And then I try to do more next week. Yeah. That's the annoying thing. I, I've never really had any th anywhere where I can like, which I can comfortably, like move move the thing apart like in the gym i'm in, at right now it's all soft blocks and it's hard to find something that's super solid to take off from and land on that isn't just going to go whoosh, because i'm landing on it at this kind of um angle um and even when i used even at the the um gym i used to teach parkour at as well it was i had the same problem with the obstacles there but uh i don't know if you've seen at the origins gym uh mm -hmm. what renee scavington and tom capola use oh, yeah. it's like these super grippy blocks you probably had something um similar at visions as well um, um yeah yeah we did and um yeah 
I was just up but yeah, that's... Time for SPL this year, which is the first time I've been able to go back for a long time, which is fun. Yeah, I saw you. I saw you in the live stream. <laughs> yeah, it's good. Oh, it was good. I'm glad I missed that. The the local Ninja Warrior gym here is really cool, and we're we're like getting more and more parkour equipment in there. But they have like a wood jump trainers, and they mm. have a carpeted floor, and then yeah, Velcro. And so they're really, really secure when you jump to them. Nice. Yeah, that sounds I decent. Like, I was like, man, this is such a good setup. And the other thing I love about their setup there is like all the parkour gyms, the way we design the parkour gym, most of the parkour gyms I've seen have uh, have uh, horse stall matting on the ground. And I can. it feels like it's impossible to get the horse stall matting clean enough. So there's always like layers of dust on the equipment. Right. Somehow that carpet that they have, they can vacuum it clean enough. And so all of the all of the painted objects in the gym are so grippy and nice. <laughs> so consistent. Mm. Love that. And then, yeah, and then yeah. the Velcroing everything down to the ground is is pretty sick. So I think that's a good uh I think the, the parkour industry could pick up on some of the gym designs that Life Force has got. Hmm. Interesting. Okay, so that's a total tangent. Um, <laughs> how many days a week are you training parkour? Well, well yeah, again, it, it varies massively because uh, the yeah. weather's kind of similar to uh, over in Seattle. And we don't actually have any gyms in Brighton. Um, so it's, it's very weather dependent and dependent on who's out as well. Like, uh, yeah, um, so ideally I'd like to train three days a week at least okay i'd say but in summer uh i was just saying to um dom yesterday on his podcast um in summer i trained uh like 20 days in a row <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and and this is something i've been trying to say as well like you can train every day again it comes down to managing load so mm -hmm. uh, your intensity and volume throughout the session um uh, and I think um, Renee Scavington has, in his off-season training Bible, I think it's yeah. called, he he spoke about having like an RPE um, system for training sessions or even like just for specific jumps. So you know you're not going beyond, say, like a six today on what's meant to be an active recovery session. Um mm -hmm um after like a hard day the day before or if you know you're going to be having like a competition or a heavy lifting day or a heavy um parkour session tomorrow um but uh in a call with uh the plyo guy that i was talking about matt mckinnis watson he yeah. he was saying something even simpler than that that might be way better than like some boring numeric scale for parkour mm -hmm. practitioners he um he said you could just do like a traffic light system. So like red is super intense, orange is moderate intensity, and green is is like your active rest recovery day. Um, and I feel like that kind of idea can be implemented in um, people that want to do um, strength and conditioning for parkour athletes or just in their own parkour training in general even without strength training people that are super in love with parkour that just want to train every day but it is super hard to kind of um rate those things yourself and it always is very subjective and then there is the added problem that we train socially like training is such a social thing and more often not more often than not we're taken in by um our training partner or whoever's there um and the 11 foot level kong pre that they're doing or something like it's, it's very hard to not be taken in by um the challenges that are happening around you yeah absolutely i yeah i think it i think that like that scale of training daily versus training you know even sometimes twice a week might be ideal for a lot of people uh, mm. it has to do with the goals that you want to pursue at the same time i think if you're like really looking to push the, the 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 power end of what you're doing or speed end of what you're doing yeah you need substantial recovery time and mm -hmm. trying to get a light session in in between a lot of times it's just going to decrease the time that you have for recovery mm -hmm. 
I think it's a good idea in some cases. Like I think it'd be great to cycle it in where you're just working on, you know, precision footwork, light climbing, flowy stuff. But if you're like and mental on, game, mental yeah. game as well. Like I I try and tell people like you don't need to be stressing yourself physically every day you can still get like most of the great training sessions we have is when we overcome something mental rather than physical or technical um i mean not maybe not most it it differs with a lot of people but that's what is massively gratifying in our sport Mm -hmm. uh the mental challenges that we put ourselves through and um yeah you can still scare the absolute shit out of yourself and have uh a great session on a rest day i think yeah yeah <laughs> i don't know if it's re- like from a from like a nervous system perspective i'm not sure if it's really restful if you're actually scared. yeah yeah there's that too that the if if we're thinking about the biopsychosocial yeah. model and uh <laughs> I'm, trying to get, I'm trying to get pretty parasympathetic between my my sessions right like a good rest day for me at 40 is like doing some yoga nidra right like lay on the ground and <laughs> sure yeah yeah <laughs> do a guided meditation yeah. So for uh, his yeah. idea, yeah, it's very how true. Many, but yeah, how many how many hours are you going to train in a session these days? Hmm. I'd say two hours. Two hours. One to three hours is is way more common for me, okay. unless it's um, like moderate, very moderate intense intensity kind of thing. How does filming for store impact your training parameters? Like. Because you have a demand to produce content on top of yeah. it. like whatever is actually optimal and best for your body and your goals. How does that play? Well, out? Yeah. Well, well, then it um, it very much depends what we're filming because if we're just escaping from a pit or something, <laughs> um, um, uh, which I say with no anguish in my voice at all. Um, <laughs> I mean, let's just say, like, if if it was my choice, we would only be filming the street rats training videos but Mm. like um what the numbers tell us is a lot of people like to see parkour in a specific context where it's being used for something and uh or or if it's in a or weirdly if it's in a spider-man costume or goku or any any other of the costume that nick provost wears yeah um damn you nick yeah people like seeing like to see parkour in a context um i mean that's not obviously that's not us like when we can tell the difference between a cork and a backflip or a cork and a back full or uh, a tic tac or any other kind of jump like where the intricacies of our sport actually matter but um um yeah those videos do a lot better than the training videos we produce um but yeah coming back to your question um those pit escape videos and various other uh concept driven videos are more often um pretty low in intensity and, and take as long to film as um a standard kind of training session either um so it's been it's been kind of easy uh recently um with that sort of thing but still i would like to be fresh like I, I i don't like going into um star filming days uh after like a very intense parkour session the day before um that makes yeah. sense. i don't um, know if that answered your question one, yeah no i think it does um <laughs> with some extra information there I watched yeah the, with, uh, with an extra tangent <laughs> slamming someone <laughs> what's the BM, <laughs> any chance uh, i get parkour versus bmx video last night and oh like, yeah I was like trying to have like this is surprisingly entertaining. I don't know why I'm so entertained by this. <laughs> <laughs> that's what that's what Dom says as well. Like he he's like he hates anything that veers away from parkour because he he loves parkour so much and yeah. thinks it should be cool enough to stand alone on its own. And I and I I shout that yeah from the rooftops as well. Like I wish it was just cool enough for other people just to stand alone where you don't have to dress up as fucking Pikachu um, or do any of these concept stuff. Um, but Dom has said that he also finds uh, our stuff very entertaining as well. And I don't know how much of that is the personality and charisma or whatever that goes behind it. Yeah. Um, 
yeah, who knows? Yeah, I mean, for a lot of us in the parkour community, like kind of seen you guys on screen since you were 14 years old, 15 years old. So it's, it's a weird, weird parasocial relationship. <laughs> yeah, 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 I bet. <laughs> connection that happens. Um, okay, so I wanted to to switch gears here. Um, what was it? Oh, before we leave the training grounds, I wanted to ask you, you've had a pretty dramatic body recomposition over the last two years. Did you go through a specific diet or is that just being able to return to sport? Um, I think it so it was a bit of both. Okay. Um, the beginning of this year, I was the heaviest that I'd ever been. Okay. Um, I was somewhere north of 90 kilos. Um, and when I weighed myself that time, I was like, no, I cannot, I cannot be, uh, I cannot be jumping um, yeah. with this extra weight. And it wasn't, you know, it wasn't all muscle. Um, as uh, some people said when I told them, it's like, yeah, I'm 90 kilos. I need to shave some weight. And it's like, <laughs> oh, but it's all muscle. It's like, it's seriously not. Like, uh, um, it is, especially after like uh, Christmas last year. Um, it's it's not good for being able to propel your body far as well as to be able to take high eccentric eccentric forces um like yeah and if i want to like reduce kilos right now so i know what you're talking about how much about 105 105 yeah yeah um uh, and yeah just just for joints and everything as well like if um my goal was to um do the sport for as long as possible and be and as little pain as possible um i thought it'd be good to to just slowly lose some weight and i did i did it with uh i started tracking my food for the first time in forever which is super weird because the idea had always i'd always hated the idea of any kind of dieting and i think in my mid-20s it was fine because i was i was eat i was kind of known for um eating a fuck ton um and that's probably why i kind of got a uh big kind of muscly build without ever doing anything close to a hypertrophy um yeah. cycle or whatever um just gonna because be i just fine. ate a fuck ton yeah. <laughs> i did like maybe um, ate a fuck ton because you were gonna be a big human compared to most parkour athletes right yeah yeah maybe that too but yeah i, I used to like take part in take part in eating challenges and i'd right. eat done stuff like um eat 48 wings trying to get on a leaderboard in this place called box shop in Brighton and then failed and then came back a week later and tried the vegan challenge and then got to the top of the board. I'd like eaten, um, three subway footlongs in half an hour, um, stuff like that. So for me to, um, like download my fitness pal and start tracking my calories and actually seeing what is going in was, um, was was kind of cool um and then i still eat whatever i want i just tweak habits a little bit and um and yeah so i, I was on a pretty modest uh calorie deficit for quite a few months and then um i think in summer um i kind of i maintained 82.5 to 83 kilos and now i think i think it's it's Na kind of natural for me and what i'm eating right now like i'm not tracking anymore but it's natural yeah. for me to maintain um like 83 84 and i'm kind of happy with that but what i was going for was was 92 i don't know if you've heard about this um 82 av2 you're, 82 you're get down to 82 was your goal yeah 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 because because uh, um i heard this rule of thumb or heuristic um and I'm sure there's loads of variability where it doesn't apply, but um, say if you, if I'm 182 centimeters mm -hmm. for an explosive jumping athlete, um, you should try to be around the range of, um, if say if that's your height, you take away the one. So I my ideal uh, weight should be 82 kilos yeah. or something. I don't know if you've heard anything like Never that. Heard I'm sure that. It wouldn't work in pounds, right? Oh yeah, no, no. I don't 
I'm so. six, six foot one, almost six foot two. 230 pounds, 225 pounds. Um, yeah, <laughs> it wouldn't work. I but I know. think, um, yeah, I don't know. 1.87 it, meters, 8.87 kilos would be really, really light for me. Uh, like, yeah, I, I was, I was, a, I think I was, a, I can't, I don't know the exact thing, but I'm probably about 92 at like, like when I'm, like when I was 25 and like skinny. I was, that big because i just mm. have really wide shoulders and big wrists and everything yeah yeah that's the thing there's this like yeah. it, it doesn't work that well as the best rule of thumb because there is so much variability but um so either way better. that was i knew i needed it to be lighter and and that's uh that was a good goal. what seemed like a logical goal to go for especially as that's been um my weight in the past where i've been like yeah. at my strongest, like when all the compilations I've made in uh, 2016, yeah. 2017 and stuff, I've been around that weight. So it was a reasonable um, goal to shoot for as well. And I just heard that along the way and I was like, oh yeah, well, makes sense. Yeah, I never heard that. But <laughs> I do think like, it's interesting because there's, there is the idea that, you know, you want as much muscle mass on your frame as possible to produce force. Yeah. Um, that's, that's yeah. But then the, and the more muscle you have, um, like the the bigger, more cross sectional muscle area, um, the more capacity for force production yeah. that muscle or joint has. But then, it's then if you're the trying to jump your, if you're trying to, you know, defy gravity, like yeah. then. Tom Tales said for a sprinter that for every pound of body weight, you need to add at least six pounds of force production. So okay. whatever, basically wherever you are, where you start to dip below that, it's like you put on as much mass as you can continue that relationship. And then once you are above that, then it's no good. But Tom Telez was Carl Lewis's coach. And if you look at Carl Lewis, you can see he was not, uh, not an extremely muscular, uh, sprinter. He's very, very lightly built. So um, mm. it's an interesting perspective you can compare to, uh, right. carl lewis to Tom, uh, ben johnson carl lewis hardly strength trained at all or hardly did weight training hypertrophy training whereas ben johnson mm. famously was squatting 600 pounds um different different body types um okay so i want to talk to you a little bit about kind of the how you see the state of parkour right now like we've had a pretty interesting dialogue about the the descent game coming in uh, last time we were here and uh mm. oh yeah that's uh that's gotten crazy i just saw joe who was uh we talked about joe skander last time is is what are you doing <laughs> yeah, <laughs> sustainable. yeah, yeah. and then in, you know in the most recent capstone he does a uh what is it does a oh God, what uh, what is that called a back toss in gymnastics it's called a back toss so swinging off of your hands and doing a backflip into right. a descent slide the descent slides yeah and capstone are sweet they're like the one yeah. he does where he like steps into it and just slides down it looks so jackie chan it's really yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Really absurd. yeah. Um, absolutely loving what uh joe scandrit's doing like he the, the when when descent started coming in when um um dylan baker originally started uh well introduced them and kind of pioneered them they were very mechanical um kind of the, the cat drops as, as what some people have called them. Um, just one after the other. And it, it kind of, it's kind of stale. Um, but yeah. Joe, Joe Scandrit still does a lot of those and pushes some really scary ones. Um, but now he adds so many different elements to it. And it is amazing to watch, um, how far you can push just creativity with going down stuff. And then there's Shane Griffin that's on the other side of the spectrum that is, um, very different to like early ascent people like Teg Head, Teg Matthews Palmers, um, where he's getting up stuff and just actually finding the fastest route. Um, That's crazy route. And actually, then then Shane Griffin is is trying to using actually some artistry to get up stuff, so it's not just about uh, yeah. you know the path of least resistance. Yeah, I love that aspect of the game right now. My favorite line in Capstone was Toby's line. Um, yeah, that that, uh, that I love wall runs, but the, the yeah. wall yeah, run yeah, yeah. into the climb, how rapid he's able to continue the momentum of the climb, 
mm. and then to do a huge dyno that high off the ground. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And then he just walks off and you think the line's over <laughs> die front. Yeah. 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 So good. That was so good. I had, um, uh, Pete Whitaker on the Stora podcast recently and he's, okay. um, he's a professional climber who, um, Toby's been climbing with a lot yeah, recently yeah. and, and he's wide been boys. getting really good. Hmm? The wide boys guys. He's the one yeah, 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 yeah. 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 That's, that's right. Um, and I showed him the clip of Toby, uh, from capstone and I asked him, what do you think most people within the climbing community, uh, will think about this? And, um, oh, I can't remember his answer now. So I, I feel bad bringing it up, but, um, <laughs> I guess I guess it's definitely climbing because it's moving up something, but there is a it's not just about getting up it. There's the speed of how you're getting up it, which is kind of the um the original parkour yeah. traditional parkour A to be as fast as possible, but yeah. it's how it looks as well. Like it's speed, but things look better when they're faster. It's yeah. not so much about how efficient it is um so it's a functionality perspective but also an artistry perspective um and i think that's a lot of what early part why we rated a lot of the early parkour traditional stuff anyway like um like you could you could argue that the remember the old nine videos parkour literally um mm -hmm. yeah yeah yeah, I do. Where, like, you can argue that it's not actually parkour, literally. Like, there were so many, there are so many obstacles which he ju he just ran around, which he could have just ran around. I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and <laughs> you can luck. tell he's 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 putting obstacles in his way. And there are a lot of times where he did uh, like a full cat leap and then climb up, where he easily just could have like jumped to a crane or jumped to waste yeah. and uh, like he would stride up one set of five or six stairs and then Kong up the next one and then dive roll the third set of mm -hmm. five or six stairs. And it's like, there is an artistic aspect to this. This is not parkour literally. Can we just get our heads out of our asses with this cliche functionality A to B efficiency mindset because we are a sport that just we just want to do hard shit and hard shit that looks good and yeah. and i'm glad that we're kind of getting out of this mentality now but the wikipedia definition has yet Such to change i never liked that definition. <laughs> i no. my definition when i started parkour visions like our working definition was yeah the discipline of developing the ability to overcome obstacles effectively um yeah and then of developing the self through that. And then I would say that basically yeah, yeah, parkour yeah. broadly construed is just playing with obstacles, right? It's explore yeah. exploratory locomotor play in complex environments where you mm. aren't using an implement, right? It's not it's not surfing or saw uh, skateboarding. <laughs> but that that's pretty much it. Um, but I do I do enjoy more utilitarian expressions of parkour personally. Like like I can get down with the super artistic side of it as well mm. um, and that can be not acrobatic um it can just be artistic and not acrobatic but there's something really beautiful about a pure expression of like i want to go somewhere what's going and be that's that's what gets a lot of people into parkour as well in the first place um tom coppola in a fairly recent sds episode says yeah. it was that functionality aspect of it that drew him into it and of course there's all the kids that saw see parkour after being obsessed with ninjas and spider-man and stuff and kind of want that functionality aspect of it as well and also we have to remember as i said earlier parkour in a context of actually trying to escape something or or like get somewhere whether it's um nick provost late for school pov or something <laughs> um like that is functional parkour in a context that is that has that uh value to it yeah i don't know my that that mindset yeah. uh what i was trying to say kind of just fizzled out just then but <laughs> i don't know if that's to yeah. your point <laughs> let's let's bookmark the functional parkour for a second i want to go back to uh sure naeem's videos 
Uh, if anyone hasn't seen him look up parkour literally, they're awesome. My favorite one in the series is actually parkour creatively, where he goes and hangs out with a bunch of German guys. It does way more fun yeah. stuff. But the yeah, yeah, yeah. Me. imaginatively, imaginatively, yeah, parkour imaginatively. Yeah. But he has a video called Parkour Naturally, where he applies the same kind of approach to moving in Fontainebleau. Oh, and I, I, I have a lot in that one, nature, right? And that one bought, drove me crazy because he does like a million cat, cat jump, cat vaults. What do you guys call them? Kong vaults. That's what we call them. Um, Kong cat pass. I, Kong, I cat pass. That's like, that's the term. Yeah. Kongs or cat passes on these small rocks and like cat prees when it's like almost air. it's just like stride up them. <laughs> like you just run across the yeah, top. Yeah. You just um, and there's so many more ways you can move creatively in a space like that. Uh, I was like, yeah, oh, do more, do more. Uh, I still feel like Fontainebleau is under underexplored for the variety of movement that it can offer. Uh, so yeah, and now now bouldering is exploded, and they're probably um, all the uptight boulderers <laughs> and climbers probably won't tolerate a bunch of uh, unruly parkour heads there is anymore. Has bouldering gotten uh, that much bigger? Because I mean, that's where bouldering started, basically. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. I mean, I mean, I'm sure they were there earlier, but um, I don't know how much of an explosion climbing has had um, yeah. in recent years. And Alex Honnold's free sense. solo certainly well, free solo, um, yeah. makes sense that it's beginning bigger. Um, so back to the speaking of bouldering, right? Like Alex Honnold, that's about a, as pure an expression of parkour as possible. Like there's the obstacle; he has to get to the top of it. Right. Yeah, you could argue that. Yeah. <laughs> right. It's like to me, I always tell people, like people are like, "Do you rock climb?" And I'm like, "Well, I climb. Climbing is part of parkour, right? Like, yeah. Like to me, bouldering is is just parkour on a relatively constrained set of obstacles with yeah. special equipment." <laughs> That's the thing. I imagine I said to Pete Whitaker in the podcast the other day, it's like, no, climbing is a part of our sport, bro. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and then gymnastics comes to us and it's like, no, parkour is a no, part of our sport, bro. <laughs> no, that, that's not true. Parkour <laughs> anyway, is carry a superior on. version of gymnastics. That's what that is. Um, <laughs> parkour contains right. everything that gymnastics is supposed to contain, but does it better. That's my opinion on that. Um, mm. We can get into that, uh, but... Maybe you should have me on the the po uh, store podcast, and I'll tell you about that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> I can get you on with um, John Hedge Hall. I'm meant to be having him come on next. Okay. And also, I I did already host a debate between Damien Puddle, CEO of Parkour Earth, and um, the head judge Nicholas Fisher from Fig. Um, okay. I don't know if you've listened to that one yet, but if no, you no, if, man. if you want to, I, I think that would be. You off. <laughs> that seems like that would be psychically painful to listen to for me i'm not sure yeah it's tough anyone from fig try to defend what the hell they're doing those yeah. incredibly boring routes that they're putting together um yeah 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 but so right now but parkour is an interesting state right now because like speaking of like efficient expressions of parkour world chase tech right that's mm. about as much and chase tag super I, I love chase tag because i've been doing that stuff since since tag yeah right like I, he was, I was super into it when it started he was so into it he at the, at the first ever uh world chase tag event which um uh they named the stora chase off um because yeah, yeah. they had they had us there and then we were just knocked out after the first round <laughs> because we, we sucked and had never practiced on the quad before um yeah. but yeah tech head was there um he 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 was super into it he even wore um like shin pads and stuff and wore clothing that made it more efficient to slide around on the ground under mm. stuff. So he was like super um, tactical and strategic with it. But, um, but yeah, carry on. Yeah. Well, yeah. So I, so I came from martial arts background. That's always been important to me. I've always kind of tried to be in both. And yeah. in, in martial arts, it's like the realization after MMA came out was like, you can't fight unless you spar in your training. Yeah. So you can do all the forms you want. You can do all the technical work you want, but you're not going to actually be able to fight unless you practice fighting. Um, and I was like, mm -hmm. well, we always talked about parkour being able to reach or escape. But I was like, are we actually practicing being able to reach or escape? Can yeah. you chase someone down? Can you be chased down? So we've mm -hmm. been playing games like that since 2008. I can't remember the timing. I think I think that I was starting to go that direction before I saw Rage Frubling. But right. once I saw Teg's video, Rage Frubling, that gave me a huge inspiration. And I started 
building lots of games. It was fun. I got to meet up with Tag and um, Bobby Matthews. Oh, really? Uh, no, that's Matthews Palmer's Tag. Bobby, <laughs> uh, Bobby Gordon Smith. Bobby Gordon Smith. Um, yeah. At Hampstead Heath a couple of years ago when I was teaching out there, we went out to dinner and talked about it. And Tag was like, yeah, mm. it's, it's dumb. It's not safe. It's like, it's, it's, <laughs> you can't. <laughs> <laughs> in retro in retrospect yeah and i was like but i've actually done it like i've built tons of progressions in order to to do it safely like you you can you can scale it just like you can scale weight training you can scale aliveness in parkour you can there's lots of ways to manipulate the variables to make it um to make it safe mm. so I, I don't know how we put out a video on my channel of like chase tag games that we played in nature i mean if you haven't seen that check it out um it's pretty it's pretty fun so we've got i might have seen something similar on instagram yeah yeah. um i actually i actually rec i know you've been on austin yokum's podcast and maybe vice versa um but he's super oh sick he's he's been super into uh integrating um lots of play and chaotic games mm-hmm. um yeah, into coaching his athletes and i really enjoy his stuff and you can yes. tell how how uh um he's been influ uh he's been influenced by you and your work yeah. uh and uh yeah he sings your praises as well like uh <laughs> he's he's a big fan um and i introduced him to uh some world chase tag videos and oh, he nice. and since then like i've seen him try and integrate uh some of that stuff into into some of his sessions with his athletes and it's yeah it's really cool yeah it's amazing too because like so when i was starting uh to talk about aliveness and parkour um basically at the same time amos was developing what he called parkour Parkour randori yeah which is yeah yeah (laughs) concept right and then amos actually kind of backed off of that he went too crazy he was doing like he was like sneaking into nightclubs and intentionally getting like yeah. <laughs> found out by uh, by uh, by nightclub security and chased down. So we can I've heard this story. Skills. Yeah, I've then, heard this then story. he was like he didn't necessarily figure out the scaling mechanism for it. But obviously <laughs> he's trained his athletes and they're just absolutely killing it in chase tag. So I think chase tag is great. Um, it was really fun for me to go up and see what sport parkour league is doing. Um, and then obviously there's fig and the problems with that so kind of how do you see and then obviously there's just what's going on in the in the parkour community i mean chokai doing corking the manpower gap um mm. yeah you know, yeah yeah pretty much an old dog in this sport um <laughs> yeah yeah it's, it's it's um felt uh insignificant and irrelevant very quickly um in terms <laughs> of in terms of action uh <laughs> in like the few years i was out <laughs> uh well not out but, i think it's but, crazy because uh, i think sorry i'm, I'm gonna I'm, I'm gonna go off on a tangent here but I'm, I'm curious about your perspective on this like you were in many ways at least one of the people setting the level for very large jumps at height for a sure. short period of time, right? Mm. And then, but how long would you say that lasted? Good question. Um, I don't know. In terms of height, maybe that didn't last too long. Like because it, it was it was mainly like the roof culture era, like two years, um, right? Yeah, yeah, I'd say I'd say so. Years and more. and there's certainly there's certainly um some of the high stuff with control that I still like pushing these yeah. days. Um in terms of scale, I I don't think I don't think for a very long time at all. The stuff that people are doing now with scale and acrobatics um and and other like super technical things, it's 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 amazing how far things have come. Yeah, I got to go into like this really weird niche where there was like me and six other guys doing it. <laughs> so I got to be the best in the world at it in some sense. <laughs> right, yeah. For a little bit, for much longer than most people get to be really good at, at at something. And then now Leo is so much better than I am at nature parkour and Matt Yang. Um Oh yeah, the primal method. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> They're just killing it. Um but uh but what I think is interesting is like I've noticed like you, nobody seems to be able to, to stay at the top of any area of parkour for very long. 
right? Like my, mm. you know, last time we were talking about my student Nate Weston, it was like Nate went out and like was smashing competition after competition after competition, and then like couldn't get paid real money to do what he was doing. Had an injury, tried to break in the yeah. industry. It's like it's hard, and yeah. Verky's been interesting to watch recently, like because it, it seemed like when he did that double Kong Gainer, it was like this is the future. This is going to be going to mm. be the guy, right? And then it was kind of like he actually like sort of stepped back for a little bit. He kept going, and then it was like it seemed like Verky cooled off, and then now he was back last year. Yeah, 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 big time. And it, I feel like I'm seeing a lot of athletes like peak for a year or two where they're like really pushing the edge of what's possible in a specific area of the sport. And then, then they'll tail off. Sometimes they'll come back. Like I think Toby's had an interesting, like he was, when you guys were first really, really getting big in the parkour community, it was like Toby's double Kongs were, were the truth, right? Nobody else was doing what he was doing. (laughs) Right. Yeah. And then it was like, you know, you can still do great double Kongs, but I wouldn't say he's necessarily the best in the world with that by any means at this point. Mm. Um, and he's certainly not putting out lots of content around that. But now he's. And, and I don't think it's ever been something that he's actively tried to seek out and push either. It's yeah. just like a lot of the time we'll just set him at stuff like a dog. <laughs> <You're just> like, <laughs> Toby, Toby, he's <laughs> a 14 footer, mate. What do you reckon? Um, <laughs> So yeah, what is your observation about that? About like how I I think that it's very hard to sustain. Like if you look at like team sports, you see that the best athletes are often the best athletes for a much longer period of time. It's like LeBron James was the best for ten years. I um, I don't know. Yeah. Like, is it um, is it pain or motivation that's stopping people? <laughs> in most cases like are, are they are they the main ones and and motivation in the sense that um is is it the people that are trying to seek out um the reward of becoming a professional in their sport and being able to make it make a living from it um because it can become very demotivating when you're churning out lots of content for free and um, you're expecting to get some kind of monetary reward for it um, as if the universe owes you something yeah. for your efforts. Um, <laughs> when, I don't know, parkour, like a lot of us don't have the greatest business model. It's um, For most of us, it is uh, uh, make content, try to get views dot 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 profit and um yes uh finding out what that dot 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 is um is is the crux of the parkour professional life i think um because most of us just seem to be trying to turn out content and um that's uh very straining on the body to try and do that very consistently um and maybe it can be demotivating after a time um when you don't get your reward and you've spent all this time and you haven't been working concurrently on some other avenue for uh something to pay the pay the bills with um and everyone's putting all their eggs in one basket in a lot of ways and uh i know i'm certainly one to do that but i'm one of the lucky ones that has found a team of seven people that are all motivated to go after the same thing. And by some miracle, we found ourselves, um, uh, you know, with a salary that is sustainable right now. Um, but yeah, for, for a lot of other people, like, um, people see the most projects as, um, and for Rang as like, uh, like the second or third best or whatever and they're i mean motors at least are are struggling just to stay afloat and i don't think they're paying their athletes anything um and a lot of people see them as super successful but from the inside it's it's not really like that and i know with parkour parkour gyms as well you can go that route um if not just content creation um a lot of people 
will lose motivation for parkour because in their world, uh, parkour is teaching it to snot nose 10 year olds that would rather be at home on Fortnite. And I think it's fucking wild that like you have to sell the idea of parkour to a 10 year old. I fucking hate it, but that's the world we live in these days when we're competing with, uh, with Fortnite, call of duty and, and easy dopamine <laughs> like that. Um, but, um, yeah, it can be super demotivating for parkour coaches. Uh, and, Parkour gyms shouldn't have to uh, have like nerf birthday parties and rent out their space for yoga and CrossFit. And uh, uh, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, maybe parkour just isn't there yet to look after its athletes. Um, and maybe maybe that's why, uh, um, because it's not getting that financial reward that is keeping you in the sport. Or maybe the problem is the fact that there is people's relationship with parkour is extrinsically motivated too much already. Yeah. I think, I, I think that the, the financial incentive I think has a lot to do with it. It's like, I, th I think, you know, your assumption is you train to be a professional athlete and you get a profession, <laughs> you know, and it's like, mm. if you're a team sport athlete and you're good enough, then you do. If you're, if you're, if you're in one of the other extreme sports, there's a lot better chance to get sponsored because people sell gear. Um, yeah. Parkour is just not, it's not, the, the financial incentives aren't there. And so I think it's just punishing, like mm. really, really hard to, to operate at the highest level of the sport at this stage. And yeah, like, I, I think, I think a lot of people have enough intrinsic motivation to get there and to continue mm. playing. But yeah to actually push the edges of it for a prolonged period of time. I think it's pretty unusual. Mm. Um, I don't know. It's just an interesting, it's interesting to me. And I wonder what would happen if, if there were, was like good financial reward associated with being a professional parkour athlete. Like what? Yeah. Geez. I mean, it's crazy how amazing we've gotten given how terrible the incentive structure is. In yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Very true. Yeah. I just think people don't like, this is one of my big arguments for why I think parkour is such a profoundly effective general motor development tool is because like we're achieving comparable levels to other sports where we're cross comparable um, without the support systems or incentive structures that they have so right. you know if if nate and eric can do triple backs off of of things and jaren who is doing double full you know double back with two full twists like these are yeah. skills in gymnastics and they're doing them off metal bars and <laughs> onto like three yeah yeah, 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 yeah. It's like this is you know this is directly comparable to gymnastics and if you look at like max jumping distances from like a short run up. Mm. Nobody in parkour trains 60 meter run ups. But if you give them mm. six steps, the gap between Joe Henderson and, you know, an elite track and field athlete, I don't think is that large anymore. It's probably. Yeah. 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 90% <laughs> of the way there. Um, and we're doing that despite not most athletes aren't coached. Most athletes didn't start when they were six years old. Most athletes aren't making any money. <laughs> Mm. Um, so, so if you think about what if, what if all those conditions were met, right? And part of it, I think is actually that the coaching models and a lot of these other sports might actually be in the way of their athletes developing optimally because they are messing up the intrinsic motivation factor. Yeah. 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 But I feel like we're, we're kind of, um, veering closer, uh, is it Nick Winkleman's, uh, kind of coaching ideas yeah nick winkleman's a huge influence of rob uh rob gray from the perception action podcast i don't know if you watched that one if you haven't that's a really good really good episode a discussion mm. with him that was actually one of the questions i wanted to get to you with you is i know you've been following the podcast and kind of dug into some of this stuff how is like learning some of this motor learning ideas impacted the way you train and uh you know approach your own your own movement or or what mm. was this? uh you're sounds like you are doing some coaching as well so how's that impacted you 
both would be yeah well i I haven't um coached much movement since covid really um that that was uh mostly what i was doing for money um then uh but yeah my own training i don't know not not a great deal to be fair i'm trying to think you think about the cues that you give yourself yeah you try to externalize your cues or pay attention to whether you're you're using internal versus external cues when you do things for yourself hmm um i think a little bit yeah yeah. I think I, th- I think a little bit, yeah. But I, th- I think uh, the little bits of coaching I've done um, recently, just some private classes here and there, I've really tried to, like, I'm very wary of um, when I get in the way of the process as well. Not over um, And, yeah, trying to let the, the subconscious mind kind of um, – against the environment kind of uh do the job yeah and and of course like um yeah too much queuing is 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 terrible for a lot of people and uh i've I've definitely seen that in action before that's why um when hearing a lot of this stuff um like rick uh nick winkleman on podcasts as well as um reading the inner game of tennis um yeah that made me definitely want to you know, just zip my mouth a little bit uh, and know when to interject. Um, but yeah, yeah, there's so many coaches that really want to show off the um, technical cues that they've learned over their time coaching. But sometimes you just need to shut the fuck up. <laughs> yeah, that's that's a that's like you know my main my my the main person who I coach personally right now is my son, uh, which is awesome. like, unique. Um, it's like where he's at the age where he now has decided that he wants to learn things. And so he'll, he'll take a break from playing and ask me to support him in learning a specific skill. Nice. We kind of get to play with this coach student relationship and Mm. uh, it's hard sometimes to just shut up. (laughs) It's, it's like, I, uh, yeah, he ran a warrior competition and I over cued him before his route and it, made his anxiety worse before the run you know like i was just kicking myself afterwards just, yeah oh, God i could have just <laughs> not talked to him it would have been so much better um but you got to learn you know even as a coach uh i so one of the areas well, i knew that was gonna happen my camera just died one second oh damn it uh, yeah so oh Still can't see. Yeah. Well, we're gonna have to finish the interview without my face on the screen here. Uh, <laughs> run out of that. Oh damn. Uh, okay. Which also means that we've kind of run low on time. So I think we'll go ahead and uh, and and stop there, Callum. I really appreciate it. It's super fun to just reconnect and uh, and have a chat. So uh, yeah, man. Let's do it again. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. It'd be score. lovely to meet you someday. Do it. Come out. Come come to a come to a thing. Actually, I'm going to try to come to Europe this year. So let's uh, mm. meet up. Um, I'll let you know about that. Uh, yeah, please do. Store on YouTube. You guys have a, a website as well, right? Just store.com? Uh, yeah, store.com. That's where you can find clothing and the occasional blog post. Um, but mostly, like, uh, instead of blog posts recently, I've been just trying to do um, – the store podcast and just get guests on and inject some more uh parkour culture into parkour um because <laughs> yeah, yeah I, don't, I don't know like I, I really rate um podcasts existing because i think since the f- days of the forums um i think a lot we've lost a lot of uh conversation context and nuance within mm. parkour and i think um yeah, I just want to host some more of that. I agree. Um, I agree so much. I, I think that the parkour is, sorry, this is a whole tangent of mine, but parkour's mm. growth through the forums and through the early algorithm of YouTube was so explosive. And when YouTube challenged its algorithm and we all moved to social media and then so much of yeah. our content moved to Instagram, it just destroyed the community. And I think we're still 
trying to figure out how to how to recapture some of those elements that were there. Um, yeah, yeah. We have a we have actually now a web forum for our online clients, our online course members. So we're trying to rebuild that space that's outside okay. of social media. Nice. So, yeah. Are you using Discord for that, or we're not? Um, we're using uh, something called Buddy Boss. It's a WordPress plugin. So we it's all through oh. our main website, which is really sick. So okay, uh, store nice. store a forum could be a thing pretty easily. Uh, hmm. I can help you guys figure out how to set that up, um, or put you in charge, touch with the people <laughs> who did it for us. Um, okay, yeah. Uh, so people know where to find you and, um, yeah, hopefully we'll talk again soon. Yeah. All right. Last one.